Just come down the hill, but still me does reach full in. Up in the book of men's body, 
ask a question. We have to wait now for the mic to move. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I am Marlon Anton James, presenting this broadcast from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, host of the seventh meeting of the OECS Council of Ministers of Education. With me here is Minister of Education of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, who served as chair of the meeting, Honorable Curtis King, and joining us via Zoom are Dr. Didicus Jules, OECS Director General, Dr. Marcia Potter, Permanent Secretary of the British Virgin Islands and Deputy Chair of CXC, and Mrs. Cicera Simon, Program Director for Education at the OECS Commission. And the presenters will all give their reflections, highlights, final thoughts coming out of the meeting. All, all in all, this briefing is intended to share with you some of the discussion points and major decisions from the council meeting. Of course, there will be a question and answer segment during which I take contributions from the media personnel gathered here and also from the regional media via Zoom. But if you're connecting with us via Facebook, feel free to leave us your comments, your questions on the OECS Facebook page or the page of VC3. Let's get the balling this afternoon, the ball rolling this afternoon with a synopsis of the meeting. The seventh meeting of the OECS Council of Ministers Education was convened on February 17th and 18th, 2022. The St. Vincent and the Grenadines Ministry of Education and National Reconciliation hosted the meeting under the theme, Education in Extraordinary Times, From Vulnerability to Resilience. OECS ministers and their teams joined virtually, along with regional agencies and international development partners. The 2021 Chair of the Council, the Honorable Sean Edward, Education Minister of St. Lucia, conferred the role of chair upon the new chair, Honorable Curtis King, Minister of Education and National Reconciliation of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Discussions were centered on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on education and the effectiveness of collective action in overcoming the challenges. The need to strengthen the OECS education system and to transform it to make it more relevant to our sustainable development was underscored. The major highlight of the meeting was deliberation on the draft OECS Declaration on Education 2022. 
That declaration foregrounds lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic and promotes a collective vision of education across member states. It spotlights the required interventions to move from vulnerabilities to resilience, in keeping with the theme of the meeting. OECS ministers endorsed oh. the Declaration on Education. The meeting was associated with a youth debate on February 10, 2022, to give the youth an active voice in addressing issues in education. Youth recommendations from the debate were presented via elocutionist Ashfred Norris of Dominica, who indicated that if we are to overcome our issue of digital literacy, we must adopt more purpos purposive training methods, and that training needs to occur across the board for teachers, students, and parents alike. Serena Dows of Dominica was the youth, spe youth feature speaker at the meeting and presented recommendations on behalf of the youth. Youth recommendations to the ministers included paying closer attention to the less privileged students who are without access to devices or internet connectivity, focusing on the slow learners and creating programs to suit their learning needs during online learning, creating and implementing training programs for parents who are not too familiar with the new technology and online learning so that they can be empowered to assist their children. Selected key decisions, ministers agreed to, one, recommend a thorough review of the teacher education programs of the OECS to determine the required interventions. Two, support the OECS to mobilize resources for the development of a new regional education sector strategy. Three, endorse an intersectoral approach to childhood intervention in the OECS that pools resources and efforts across sectors of education, health, social and youth development to address the needs of the most vulnerable and at-risk learners. Four, commit to strengthening systems within MOEs, that's the Ministry of Education, Ministries of Education to improve access to data. Five, endorse the establishment of a technical working group to explore and conceptualize a regional approach to information management solutions. And six, endorse the OECS Declaration on Education. Now, based on that overview, Minister King, it would be interesting to know what your first time experience as chair of the meeting was like. Talk to us about what stands out to you most. Thank you very much, Mara, and good afternoon to viewers, listeners. Well, it, it was indeed a very useful and productive experience. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mala, and good afternoon to listeners and viewers. Indeed, the experience was a very useful and productive one, being obviously my, my first opportunity to host the Council of Ministers meeting. Clearly, the challenges would have been certainly different from that of a face-to-face -face meeting. And therefore, in this um, period where we are forced basically to make that adjustment, certainly, the issue of the management of time became very, very important throughout the period. And I would say, if anything stood out in terms of my own experience, is that um, effort at seeking to manage what we had to do in the two days within the specified time period. But certainly, as I indicated, it was a very productive and useful experience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Minister King, for sharing that with us. 
and I would engage now on Zoom Dr. Jules. I've read that Dr. Jules believes that transformation in education is critical to address our vulnerabilities and make the education sector resilient. So my question to you, Dr. Jules, is with you at the helm of the OECS Commission, what's the plan for such transformation? Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to give compliments to both Ministers Edwards and Minister King. Minister Edward uh, assumed the position of Chair of the Council of Ministers of the OECS um, shortly after the election in St. Lucia and was able to carry the baton seamlessly. And he's now passed it to Minister King. And I have to compliment Minister King for as a, a new Minister of Education for the excellent job he did in chairing this meeting, both in terms of the efficient use of time. It has undoubtedly been our most efficiently chaired ministerial meeting in education to date, as well as him bringing tremendous insights from his experience as a teacher to the mix. Um, the question you asked with respect to the thematic of the meeting, Obvious, it is a very obvious theme that we had to pick up on because such is the nature of the times in which we live. However, the emphasis on transformation of education was not just simply on how do we transform the education system, but also the role of education in transforming our societies and helping us to deal with the volatile, uh, uncertain, um, confused and ambiguous times in which we now live. And I think we all agree that this is going to be an indefinite condition, but it is also an opportunity to do things that we have, we knew that we had to do, but we took time to do with a, with a sense of urgency. And so we've had no choice but to move in the direction, for example, of digitization of education. So it has been very heartening because we, we've, we've taken a systematic approach to this. We look in design thinking and systems thinking not just looking at education in its own silo, but education as it intersects with health, as it intersects with the demands of the future, how it intersects with our capacity to define ourselves in a very volatile world with even geopolitical align realignments and shifts happening on top of all of the crises of climate change um, and, and, and uh, uh, disasters and so on. So, what, is, what, what I think we can look forward to in the near future is the shaping, we're well on the way with this, of a new strategic plan for the OECS, which all member states have committed to, because ministers have had their input into this. They've given us the directions in terms of the priorities that they would like to see. We've called on all of the top expertise within the OECS in that regard. And very importantly, we have brought to the table the voices of parents and students in particular, as well as teachers, in what needs to be done to redefine ourselves. Um, for us, the voices of young people, and you will see on our social media, the recordings, the presentations that were made by the students themselves to the ministers, some very powerful and insightful um, presentations that will really speak to what students, from a student perspective, from the persons who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of the education system, what they would like to see in assurance of their own future. And um, that is a sacred principle for us going forward, the engagement of stakeholders in defining the future. Thank you. Dr. Jules, and I remind our media personnel that the floor is also open for you to ask your questions or make your comments. So I will make my first call as to whether or not you have um, questions at this time. And we have a question from Larissa representing SVG TV. Not hearing Larissa.
Mr. Can, can you speak a little louder, please? We're not hearing. How many of the recommendations are we taking on board? Um, especially with I, I noticed one with the education and the parents. Um, Mr. King? Well, I'm sorry we started hearing Larissa and then we just not hearing her. <coughs> I think the mic is dysfunctional. Recommendations made Marla by Dr. Jules. Nerissa is asking about the recommendations made by the youth. She's asking how many of these recommendations will be taken on board by St. Vincent and the Grenadines? Well, if my recollection serves me right and my colleagues here can verify, I think all of the recommendations made by the young people have, have been adopted by the ministers. Um, when you hear us, when you get the recordings, you will be I think wowed by the depth, um, the the integrity of these recommendations, and um, you see why they've all been adopted. But essentially, they all adopted. And and bear in mind that one of the young people who spoke was what eleven years old, ten, ten, ten years old. Okay, um, as Dr. Jules indicated, this is basically um, a meeting of council of ministers, and we basically take back these recommendations to our respective governments, and naturally, they become part of the national initiative, in this case, education. So. Clearly, these recommendations will be implemented first, I, I would say, within the context of a regional approach, since we are basically coordinating a regional approach to these issues. And naturally, each individual country will play their own part in ensuring that these recommendations are put in place. Take, for example, and, and Marla, I will say, this certainly would have been one of my highlights over the two days. The presentation made by the, the, the youth representative of Dominica, and he identified a number of issues, but I just want to focus on one that clearly demands follow-up and in fact form part of the, the the number of recommendations that have come out of the meeting he spoke to the issue of standardized testing and he was asking whether or not standardized testing is still relevant at our stage of development here in the OECS. And he made the point, it is not that he is saying that you must remove standardized testing altogether, but he was looking at his own experience as a student and as his, um, the experience of fellow young people like himself and bemoaning the fact that the standardized test does not, in a sense, present an accurate well, view of the student's competence, what he can do or she can do or cannot do. And as such, what he was doing there is basically pointing to the challenges we have with the assessment that we do in our schools. And that in itself, assessment, as a major issue, form part of the broad discussion over the last two days. And coming out of this meeting, 
a decision was taken to have an immediate follow up to discuss this whole issue of assessment and so we are going to have a special meeting where we are going to look at the issue in greater details with the intention of coming up with practical um, practical solution if you like practical recommendation to dealing with the issue of assessment to make it more relevant to the stage at which we are with our education and and that meeting that meeting will be held in, in early march Thank you so much, Minister King. Are there any more questions or comments from the media here or online? If not, my question to Mrs. Simon is now that the OECS Declaration on Education has been endorsed by the Council of Ministers, and that's all well and good, but what provisions are made for communicating the ideas of the Declaration to the layman with the intention of getting all stakeholders on board. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Marla, for this. Um, certainly, we have begun developing our communication strategy now that the ministers have given uh, the endorsement of um, the OECS Declaration on Education. And of course, the recordings or part of the recordings here from our Council of Ministers meeting, that will be made available. And as indicated, uh, an entire strategy or plan for greater stakeholder, um, while we got them involved, but awareness of, of what we intend to do. Um, students, most importantly, we really need to get them on board. And the other major um, aspect of this is to ensure that this declaration does not remain as simply a document, but a living docu document in that it really informs um, the programs, the policies, the operations to an extent of within ministries of education. And I think there has been a clarion call across um, um, over the last two days for a, a real intersectoral approach um, to education. And so this declaration, we will be reaching out to our other key partners, health, social development, and other related ministries to ensure that everyone owns this document and it does not simply remain a document to simply guide education development. Thank you. The floor is still open. Any questions or comments from the regional media? Okay. If we have one from Alicia George. Go ahead, please. Yes, I was uh, asking if any challenges in education be became more apparent during the pandemic. I assume it's something that would have been discussed in length by the ministers. Who would like to take this one? If I may, um, I think there are some obvious fractures in education that were very made even more acute. Ministers spent a lot of time discussing the question of no child being left behind because of not just the digital divide, but the disruption of learning as a result of the pandemic. And uh, one of the things that the ministers were very clear about, uh, several of them made that point, that there's a sort of romanticism post-pandemic in all of our exhaustion about this to talk about the return to normalcy. The normalcy that we experienced before from an educational perspective was never really a normal because of the patterns of performance and so on. So what we're really talking about now is using that situation to ensure that we do things right, that we correct the deficiencies of the education system and the guiding, the North Star for that is that no child should be left behind. Whether we talk in the digital divide, we talk in impact of poverty on education, whether we talk in access to learning material, quality of instruction, the forms of assessment, no child must be left behind. And so all of our efforts are being converged on that North Star. Right. right. And, and with that, with that being, being said, said 
can we just go to um, CXC? I, I believe uh, last week or week before last, there was a, a press release that indicated that the exams would be back to normal. Is there any chance, based on that meeting that you guys may have early in March, that it would influence, um, I guess, the normality of uh, CXC proceedings this year? Well, I have not heard myself um, or seen the documentation relating to that concept of normality, but we are very clear that there can be no return to normal as we knew it before. And even when we think are stabilized, there will need to be a new normal defined. Um, the ministers have had some discussions on that and Cicero spoke to the need, the agreement by ministers that we are going to have a special meeting on assessment because the ministers are clear on some of the changes that they would like to see happen, adjustments, um, unlike some what is happening in some of the international space, like with Cambridge, where they're talking about literally passing every student now, changing, dropping their standards, adjusting to the, the pandemic situation. We believe that there is a way to improve learning, um, in, improve standards, while also accommodating to the reality of the situation. And um, it will be premature to reveal what these discussions would yield, but we certainly have, are going to have a meeting with ministers specifically to look at assessment and what the OECS would require from CXC and our recommendations to CXC in that regard. Okay, were there any discussions on how much it may cost to digitalize the curriculum as you know to get more technology involved and i say this knowing that we often approach things in unison within the oecs and perhaps the the talk of costs would come up in some way or the other we've not focused on costs so much because a lot of the effort being made at the regional level is to do what we need to do at minimal cost to governments we are deeply conscious of the fact that the member states' resources are stretched thin, that we have unprecedented levels of debt accrued as a result of the, having to respond to the pandemic, to, in the case of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the volcanic eruptions, to climate change impacts, and so on. So um, as far as the digitization is concerned, the OECS has a project with the World Bank on um, digital transformation. And the, there's an education component to that. But we are not just working in silos. Um, a lot of our efforts around the entire digitization thrust are all tied together. And one of the projects that we are well advanced in is the development of what we call a digital um, learning ecosystem that will ensure that from cradle to grave, from whether in school or out of school, whether academic, technical, or professional, all training is converged in that digital space, in that platform that will have different portals for different levels of access. And already some of these components have been done. Um, if you provide us with your email address, or I think maybe I could ask my comms team to, to do a specific release on that so that we will give you the links that would allow you to see some of those things. Um, maybe Cicero could speak to the portal we have that has the 7,000 books freely accessed. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We're looking at, um, for example, for uh, even as a, so a sector like early childhood education, what can we do for online learning to boost early childhood? And the answer to that is not to transpose chalk and talk into the digital realm. That would not work, particularly with kids at that level. So we're looking at the gamification of education, put in educational games, puzzles, mm -hmm. quizzes, and so on online. That would, that's what the, think of, I don't know if you have any kids, Alicia, but if you have a three-year-old, a five-year-old, and you give them a device, that's what they go, is going to excite them. So rather than have to teach them as if they're in a classroom, let them play the kind of puzzles and games online that in the process of playing those games, they'd be discovering and learning things for themselves, how to spell, mathematical quizzes, all of, all of, all of these challenges. Okay, right. actually, I actually do have ch children. I have two nine-year-olds and a four-year-old, and they're all interested in, I'm sure, the gamification of education because they're talking about building software uh, at such a, a young age. I just want to ask you, lastly, you mentioned that 
um, the ministers discussed no child being left behind. Has there been research or documentation within the OECS on how the pandemic has affected education reaching to students? Yes, we actually presented to the minister, the special, the special report. We actually prepared a special report to the ministers on um, mm -hmm. on education, on the impact of, um, I don't know if you can see this, they zoom in, the special COVID-19 report, um, looking at the impact of COVID on education. Now this came, there was a survey done on our bias on this, but um, we noted a lot of data gaps that we need to pursue in order to really make full use of the information in order to more precisely target the areas that we need to target. So that work is a, a work in progress. All right, thank you very much. Okay. I, yes, Mal, I just wanted to make um, two short interventions in response to some of the questions um, raised by the, the, the representative there of the media. Um, firstly, the issue of the neglect of the integration of ICT in the teaching learning process was exposed by the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And what the meeting recognized and, and acknowledged, and it came out especially during the presentation of our youth representative. What I'm talking about acknowledging and, and recognize is, is the fact that as a region, we have experienced many hazards over the years, annually. It's just every year. And given our experiences, it suggests that this is an area in which we should have been better prepared. So the meeting did acknowledge and recognize our deficiency there. But it also acknowledged that efforts were being made to deal with this issue, both at the regional and national levels. Now, at the regional level, we saw the procurement of tablets or devices which were distributed to some member country coming through the, the efforts of, of um, the, the, the management unit at the OECS through partnership with the global partners in, in education. And of course, persons in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are well aware of the, the local government initiative in providing um, devices for, for all the students in secondary, primary, and, and, and some at post-secondary um, institution. So that even though we did not quantify um, a cost as such, we did recognize that there are initiatives at both the regional and national level that are seeking to deal with this whole issue of, of, of um, integrating ICT technology in the teaching learning process. And in any event, we all recognize that schooling as we know it would not be the same after the pandemic. And as such, we have to be prepared for other hazards, for other situations like what we have seen with the COVID-19 pandemic. And as such, we must be in a better position to have the continuity of, of, of learning, to, to, to build greater resilience, if you like, so that our, schooling, our school would not be so disrupted. Yes. Thank you very much, Alicia, 
for your participation there. And I invite any other um, representatives of the media who would like to make a contribution at this time to do so. If not, I have a question for perhaps Dr. Dr. Jules, with the direction in which education is going, or education has gone, particularly with heavy emphasis on online learning. What considerations have been given to students of technical and vocational education and training whose work is primarily hands-on? Well, that is part of the work that we are doing with respect to the new normal that I spoke about earlier, because we believe going forward, schools are not going to reopen in the same way. And there are a number of, of um, models and opportunities that we have to explore. So there is, for example, the proposal, again, depending on the size of the school, if you have a school of a thousand students, in the new normal, I doubt a thousand students will return to school five days a week. So it may be a situation where with a, a, a population of a thousand, you may have to do them in um, divide it into three groupings or perhaps two groupings of 500 each, depend on the spacing protocols that will be required. Because bear in mind, the experts are saying that even if we get past COVID, new variants, new pandemics are going to come fast and furious in the future. So we have to reconfigure the school to that end. Um, whenever students return, so that we foresee that the future will be a, com a hybrid approach to education that is going to involve learning at home as well as learning at school. And each of these presents unique characteristics that we now need to build into our design of education. So for example, learning at school, for the days when students are at school, we may very well have to look at the types of activities that require um, social interaction, contact stuff like physical education, home economics. In fact, the TVET subjects may be very well suited to face-to-face -face learning and hands-on stuff in school. On the other hand, um, a lot of the more quote-unquote academic subjects may be best be done online. Um, however you do it, we are thinking that, again, with the technology available, it is possible for those who are at school, those who are at home, to be still following what is happening at school if there's a component of lecturing happening. And that, and that, that the, the content of educational instruction should be available 24 7. So you can go online if you miss a lecture and see the lecture, follow it. There'll be a whole compendium of exercises, online quizzes, activities that you can undertake, interactive activities that would take you through the process of learning in that subject. Um, so, that's, so that's one thing. Um, we expect too that the, that also has implications for teachers. And that's why when we spoke in the meeting with the ministers about teacher education, I think Minister King spoke to that earlier. There's a recognition that we need to complete, take a fresh look at what is required to be a teacher in these conditions. And we now need to equip teachers, maybe some degree of specialization because the face-to-face -face will be a different type of face-to-face. And now we cannot do chalk and talk on the internet. So we need to also provide training for teachers in the pedagogy of distributed learning and online instruction. So there are a lot of changes that need to happen and these changes cannot happen in silos. Unlike in the past where we said, okay, we need to do curriculum re redesign. So a group of people designed the curriculum, but they didn't look at the whole picture. What about if you redesign the curriculum? What about the training of teachers to deliver the curriculum? What is the involvement of teachers in that redesign? What are employers and um, the people who are going to use the, the quote unquote products of the education system comfortable with that syllabus? How, how modernized is it, right? And then is our assessment being re, re, redesigned to match the new curriculum? So going forward, we have to take a design thinking approach, a systems approach to the changes that we make and look at all aspects of the system at the same time and ensure that they all fit together in a seamless way. Thank you so much. 
and uh, I ask once again if there are any questions or comments from the media representatives here in St. Vincent and Grenadines or online. If uh, not, just one more. one more. <laughs> Sorry, just one more for me, uh, if possible. I, I'm curious to know um, how sports fits into the curriculum, uh, to what extent that was discussed. Well, we didn't speak specifically about sports, but in discussing the reconfiguration of learning that I spoke to earlier, there is a record, I did mention physical education, first sports is part of that, that the, right now, before, perhaps only those in different, in our schools, maybe those students who are more inclined to be physically active and so on were part of sporting activities. Now, whenever we have school, um, education happening at school, as this thing from at home, physical education and sport will have to be an integral part of that because it is an opportunity for students rather than be um, sedentary at home because you know left to their own devices literally speaking students would just be on a couch mm -hmm. surfing all day when they come to school we can't have them just sitting in a bench all day mm -hmm. so you have to weave in sports physical activity um you know and, and the, the learning the, the opportunities colleagues in the media are endless it, we are only limited by our imagination i mean it's really exciting in for us in education notwithstanding the, the, the devastating impact in lives and livelihoods with COVID, it is the best opportunity we have had in education to transform Caribbean education, to make it something really meaningful and relevant to us. So for example, we, one of the things that we put in into the digital um, learning ecosystem is a set of activities and packages, videos for parents of how you can, how you as a parent can continue and encourage learning at home using everything that is in the home. You don't have to be a teacher to encourage, you can be an illiterate parent, view those videos and be able to ensure that your children are learning. So just a quick example, what do children do at home? You wake up in the morning, say your prayers, go brush your teeth. Even these two activities are golden opportunities for learning regardless of the level. Why are you saying your prayers? What are prayers? Okay, are you just going to recite the same prayer every day or are you going to speak to God from your heart? And what does, what does praying do for you in terms of formulating the, the, your ambitions for the day, your wishes for the day, what you wish for others, all of that, right? What is the power of prayer? That's a whole RK lesson there by itself. But more than just an RK lesson, it is also an opportunity to, to develop yourself and then go brush your teeth. Why do you have to brush your teeth? An opportunity, go research. If you, you know, you, you're an illiterate parent, go on your computer. I need you to pick up pictures for me of what tooth decay looks like and show me the pictures. Let's talk about that, right? How do you brush your teeth? The techniques of brushing your teeth. Is, that, is brushing your teeth with Colgate the only way you can brush your teeth? Do you know about swishing with virgin coconut oil, which is something mm -hmm. we have? Mm -hmm. I have tried it and you'll be amazed how clean your mouth feels. And, and when you spit it out, there's literally no oil. It's all white froth, but it's super clean. So all of, what is the science of that? What is, what is the chemistry of this, right? So everything that we do, it brings ed, an opportunity to bring education closer to life and learning not for school, but for life. Okay, I know I said this was my last, but this is indeed my final because uh, I thought it was important. We live in, in hurri hurricane prone areas, you know, we're prone to a lot of natural disasters in our region. Uh, pairing that with digital learning where we need videos, uh, sometimes we're gonna need the internet, was an altern alternative to learning post disaster discuss. What happens if there's a hurricane that affects a particular country? Uh, how is that going to be dealt with? Well, that was not discussed at this meeting, but the commission has been hard at work for the last two years. Um, in fact, three years ago, we signed an agreement with a company that was um, launching satellites to have uh, internet from satellite. And the device that they had was the size of a, of a large dinner dish. That you, so even on a, on a vehicle, you could have that vehicle, that device mounted and received. It's just a flat dish. 
size of this laptop and you can um you could receive internet 100 megs download um that company of unfortunately went bankrupt and we are now reaching out to companies like Elon Musk's company to see how we can get that um, satellite by internet. We are one of, um, I think, three or four regions in the world where there's a project called GIGA in, um, involving the International Telecoms Union as well as the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. In, we've already done the mapping of all schools on a geographic information system. We have maps of the countries, including St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and the location of each of your schools. And what we've done on top of that is to add information layers to that geographic mapping. So for each school, we've mapped what is the bandwidth that is available to that school. Some schools that don't have, we know they don't have. So we have calculations as to what is the bandwidth required. Now that is that process started well before, um, it's since 2018. So that was pre-COVID. Now with COVID, we've said to them, the idea is not just to provide bandwidth to schools, but ensure we have bandwidth ideally to the home, if not to the home, at least within the community, by way of hotspots that where students can converge in order to get internet access. So this is a live project that we have going. As I said, the OECS is one of three regions in the world where this is happening. And um, the big and because of the partnerships we have around that, the effort is UNICEF is part of this as well. We are trying to mobilize the resources financially to make this happen. Again, a lot of the initiatives that we are undertaking from the digital learning ecosystem to broadband for learning at home and at school, we are trying to do this at zero cost if possible to our governments because there are other priorities that governments have to do with the social safety net, with managing debt and all of this. So we have to be self-reliant in our approach to those things and be creative. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Jules, you spoke about partnership a while ago and the very level at which the meeting engaged regional and international partners speaks to the importance of collaboration. So Dr. Potter has been um, silent in the conversation. I'd like to bring her in now with the question on how she feels about collaboration. Dr. Potter? Okay, thank you. I'm just trying to get my video started. I think somebody has that. Okay, great. Thank you, Marla. Um, just to give my kudos to, before I say anything else, to Dr. Jules and the EDMU team at OECS for all the hard work that they do to assist us across the region um, in taking our education systems forward. Um, collaboration and partnership is key. Our ministries of education can't do it alone. And so one of the key groups are development partners. And we did have a round table discussion this morning or should say conversation with some of those development partners and looking at um, how they can assist us further in the region as we look at this new era that we have moved into, that it's no longer what we were accustomed to. It is, uh, well, Dr. Drew says a new normal, I call it a new regular. Um, because it's going to become the regular way of life um, for us. And so our development partners, both internationally and regionally, are extremely important in assisting us, whether financially or through technical assistance. But collaboration goes a little bit further than that for me. Collaboration also needs to happen within each of our countries. Um, there has to be, and I think it was Dr. Jews or maybe Minister King who, who mentioned it, that the multi-sectoral um, way of, of doing things, all of our ministries within our, in our countries touch on education or education touches on all of them in some form or fashion. And so we must develop that partnership within our countries, among our ministries, all of our departments, all of our statutory bodies and so on to bring about the results that we desire to see in our education system ensuring the end result of um, 
making sure young people are developed in the way that they need to be developed and continue the development of all of our countries across the region. Thank you so much. And um, I've learned about the Smart Schools initiative taking place in, in the British Virgin Islands. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how collaboration is working there? Uh, certainly. Uh, the Safe School, Smart School project, uh, um, well, the Smart School project came out of the Safe School project when we started it. And it was basically, uh, PAHO had a safe hospital project and we took uh, the idea from PAHO and developed it for the education system. And so in the BVI, we have a certification um, process where our schools are um, assessed by a team and first they're assessed to make sure that they are safe, safe schools. If they're safe schools, they're certified as such. And if they take the next step to become smart schools, then they are also certified as a smart schools. And this is done across both the public and, and private sector. We have a very, very close collaboration with our disaster management department. Um, they have really, really been working with us to ensure that that get what got off the ground in the first place and that it has continued. Now we've had a lot of devastation coming out of 2017 and we're still fighting to get um, school plans back to what they, they were. And as Dr. Ju said, my policies, we can't necessarily get, that, get them back to what they were. We now have to look at um, different ways in which our, our school plans are going to be developed as we, we rebuild and so, as we do that construction, the smart school criteria is presented to all of our contractors so that they can make sure that the schools become smart schools at the end of the day. Last call for any questions or comments from the media as we will quickly wrap things up in just a minute. If nothing else, then I will uh, ask Minister King, Dr. Jules, Mrs. Simon, for any final ideas that you would like to share related to the meeting. Anything before we close? Well, I think Minister should have the last word, but I would simply appeal to the media to sign up on the OECS website to receive our updates. Um, it's www.oecs.int. You can put in your address and you get fortnightly updates of everything happening at the OECS. Also, we are on all the social media, Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter. So please follow us. So that way you kept abreast. And most importantly, we welcome an ongoing dialogue with you. So please feel free to you know, shoot questions, ask questions, send suggestions in. Um, we would welcome, we, we, are, we have some really committed colleagues, particularly in the education sector, who would be happy to participate in any discussions. You have fora that would help spread the public message and explain what we're trying to do. But the input of the public, parents, students, mm -hmm other stakeholders is vital to this education enterprise. No bureau, set of bureaucrats or technocrats can do this alone. At the end of the day, education is everybody's business and it is everybody's responsibility. Over to you, Minister Chair. Dr. Jules, viewers, listeners, we have come to the end of two days of intense discussions. We have arrived at several recommendations, but all the great things that we would have done over the last two days will amount to very little unless we have them being implemented. And that is always the challenge with these meetings and forum and forum that we have, especially at the regional and international levels. Certainly, coming out of our meeting, 
we do recognize the importance of the integration process here in the sub-region. And most persons would know that we have gone further than most others in the region in terms of our integration approach. And certainly, this is yet another example for us to build on what we have done thus far. So I have no doubt that those recommendations coming out of this meeting, once taken back to the respective countries, we are going to see action. What is very, very important is the structure we have in place to ensure that such decisions are implemented. Because it, outside of the Council of Ministers meetings, or if you like, the annual Council of Ministers meeting, we do have opportunities for caucuses. And these are done quarterly. So that we have an opportunity to examine what would have been done over the last quarter and to make efforts to correct whatever defici deficiency existed over that um, preceding quarter. Now, it is very, very important also that we mobilize the sort of resources that would help us to implement some of these decisions. Everything carries a cost. And as was mentioned, we, we, we had our regional partners in the meeting. We had international partners who do provide us with technical and, and material support that help to further advance our work. But I'm saying it is always crucial that we work collaboratively to ensure that these things are done. And I have no doubt that we would be doing so. And I have the added confidence that our effort at integration is going to ensure that we keep on this focus of having a coordinated response to our educational challenges. The track record thus far has been good, and we expect to continue in the same vein. So I just want to thank all the members of the various delegations, the ministers of education, the, the permanent secretaries, the chief education officers, and other members of the respective um, ministries of education throughout the sub-region. I want to thank the OAS Education Management Unit and the, the, the the, the technical experts in that unit for their tremendous work. And of course, I cannot leave out our Director General of the OAS, Dr. Um, Jules, who coordinated the whole process. We are indeed grateful for your work. We want also to share our appreciation for the work of our partners, regional and international, and who have taken the time out to participate in these discussions over the last two days. Of course, the youth representatives. I mean, I, I, I sat here and, and, and listened earlier to, to their presentation, and as I indicated during our meeting, it gave me hope basically when I, I listened to the presentation from our young people and the depth of those presentations in terms of the recommendations, the ideas, and so on. I want to thank the media and, and pray that the media would do all that it can to ensure that the message from this meeting gets out to the broader sub-region because Whatever we do, the stakeholders in this thing, the most important stakeholders are the people who we are trying to reach. And we believe that the media has a significant role in ensuring that we get the message across. 
Um, we are talking about moving our education to a next level. We, we have been saying that all the time, that look, what happened pre-pandemic period is not going to be the same in the post-pandemic period. Even where we were reluctant to make these changes, these changes are being forced upon us. And as such, we have no choice, basically, in the matter. We just have to make the changes that are necessary to continue to advance our education. And with that understanding, with the support from the various stakeholders, I am sure that next year, when we meet, we would be meeting after we would have advanced our education further than which it is today. Once again, thank you all for being part of this very important today meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister King. And to end, I echo Dr. Jules's comment that at the end of the day, education is everybody's business and everybody's responsibility. So let's all do our part in effecting positive outcomes for our children in the region. This activity brings a close to the seventh meeting of the OECS Council of Ministers of Education, hosted by the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you very much, Minister King, Dr. Jules, Dr. Potter, and Mrs. Simon for your participation. And to all that have joined this press briefing, thank you for your attendance and your attention. Good afternoon.